Chapter 27. I'm leaning down over my desk, scrawling out notes, when a movement catches my attention and I look up. It's Jenny, two rows over and one seat up. She's slamming her hand against the plastic binder, trying to force it down into her book bag. In a moment of either very good or very bad timing, she lifts her head and looks towards me. We make instant eye contact. It's for less than a second, but long enough that I know she has seen me, that I've crossed her mind. As soon as she realizes who she's looking at, it seems, she jerks her body back to the front and sits rigidly in her seat. Craning my neck, I stare for a few more seconds at the slice of her striped t-shirt that I can see through the desks and bodies. I raise two fingers and wave at her. It's Jenny who I've missed, even more than Sarah, over the past few months. The way she shuffles slightly when she walks, her ridiculous laugh, even her long-winded stories. Dr. Nelson said we need to focus on the important things first. Pencils, my grades, bed, bath, and beyond. But a warmth has risen in me just from catching her eye, just from thinking about her. And I realize she might be one of the important things. Maybe I could explain, and then she wouldn't be so mad. She would understand, hopefully, why I yelled at her. Twice. I'll just tell her the truth. I'll tell her everything. But I know that's not an option. There's too much to say and not enough words. It would take a book to really summarize what's happened here. I tell myself to remember to bring this up with Dr. Nelson. In the time since I discovered socks were okay a few days ago, my mind has been bombarded by a meteor shower of safe items falling back into my life. At breakfast, my mom's glass of milk and my cup of orange juice sits placidly on the counter. The cancer waves that usually surround them are gone. When I go to dig the Christmas gift cards out from under the bed, I find a benign pair of khakis. And somehow the gray sh sweatshirt with the cartoon horse trots its way back as well. Breathing out a sigh of relief, I grin at myself in the new outfit as I rotate in front of the mirror. It's Saturday afternoon, and it's our first trip back to our old stomping ground since my nightmare. The mall is packed, so my mom and I are the very last row of spots, at least a five-minute walk across the treacherously cracked slab of pavement. I'm not going to be able to make it in one breath. I know this from the start. About a hundred steps in, as usual, the fuzziness creeps into the edges of my mind. My heart pounds as the blood vessels in my face and neck bulge outward. My mom is talking incessantly, and I don't think she notices when I lunge forward slightly, exhaling two lungfuls of old air. Leaning back dizzy, I take a few normal breaths against my will. And as I glance up at the wispy clouds above, the typically green contaminated air feels strangely pure in my lungs. Even though I can see green leaf bushes dotting the medians and tall evergreens planted along the edge of the mall itself, there don't seem to be any cancer fumes polluting the parking lot. I slowly, sniffly gently at the air, huh? And I breathe normally, stepping over cracks in the asphalt, walking by green patches of grass and green cars until we reach the main entrance of the mall. As I open the door, a wave of comforting heat blows forward, along with the distant sound of classical music playing over the speakers. We pass illuminated stores, gumball machines, photo booths. Without words, we know the familiar route, the loop we always follow that connects the handful of my favorite stores. After you, my darling, my mom dons a fake British accent and gestures toward the escalator. Inside American Eagle, the music is blaring loudly through a thick layer of perfume. I poke tentatively through the stacks of clothes, wary of getting too close, wary of triggering the alarm system that is on the brink of explosion. I know there's nothing real to be scared of, but that doesn't make it any less scary. I tiptoe aimlessly around the circular tables covered in mounds of per perfectly folded, color-coded piles. Well, what about this? My mom appears out of nowhere, barely containing her excitement. In her hand is a pink button-up with tiny flowers sewn over stripes. It's terrible, really terrible. But as I begin to shake my head, I look at her face, and she's so happy. She's moving sideways from foot to foot, so I lie. How pretty, I didn't even see that, I wave my hand at her, and she walks over and hands it to me. I roll my eyes slightly and quietly pat on myself, or be myself on the back for being such a good daughter. There are sweaters, walls of denim, another wall of corduroy t-shirts, sequins, beads, and that's when I see it. A white linen blazer hanging on the second row of hooks high on the wall. Gold buttons with small engraved anchors. The inside lining is silk, white and blue stripes. Oh, it's perfect. It will look so good with my brain cancer, brain cancer, brain cancer, brain cancer, brain cancer, brain cancer. No, I scream to myself, stomping my foot against the cement floor. It's beautiful. My hands clench into fists, preparing for a fight. It's a blazer, just a jacket, just pieces of cotton sewn together. It's a blazer, nothing more. Excuse me, sir. I wave over to the so sales associate who is folding polo shirts on a wooden table, talking over the sound of my brain. Could you please get me one of those white blazers down for me? Extra small. I'm wearing my newly safe pair of khakis as I slide a navy blue shirt off its thick wooden hanger. My hip bones are protruding sharply outward, and the notches in my sternum climb upward like a ladder. Looking in the mirror in the tight, oblong dressing room, I see that I'm still bones and sharp curves and ribs, but my skin has lost its sickly yellow tone. Despite my knotty hair, as if, if I'm at the right angle I, and I catch the right light, I look a little bit like myself. The floor of the dressing room is hardwood, so I tight rope, walk my way sideways down the hall and pose on tiptoes in front of my mom. She stares at me, nods twice, and comments very nice before bringing her hand up to her mouth. There's more going on in her head than I can probably imagine. Dr. Nelson has told me a few times that my parents are deeply worried and intensely curious about my progress. 
but I don't want to talk to them. Not about this. And I make Dr. Nelson promise she won't share anything either. I don't want them to know about this part of me at all. This is my problem, my secret. After about 20 seconds of her silent emotional gaze, I'm getting uncomfortable. There are tears welling in her eyes as she watches me rotate in front of the mirror. Oh, for goodness sakes. Really, mom? I jerk my head around the dressing room, moving my arms to show her that we're in public. Really? She immediately looks at me as if expecting it. I know, I know. Wiping underneath her eyes, she adds, I'm just a mom. You're going to have to give me a second. I roll my eyes at her as my heart swells. I love you too. I tiptoe back to the dressing room and slip into the white linen blazer, adjusting it in the mirror. The shoulders are crisp. The sleeves are the right length. The seams cinch at my sides. It's perfect. I take it off and throw it onto the seat without even showing my mom. I'm getting that blazer. But I cause cancer, it screams. I reach down and fold it over onto itself. Shut up. We settle down on a wooden bench, our shopping bags tucked between our legs, sharing a hot pretzel from Monty Ann's. It's our routine. I don't think my mom and I have ever entered a mall without splitting a buttery, salty, delicious hot pretzel. I pull and she pulls and two rounded arches tear off into our fingers. I've already decided that mall pretzels are a different species from normal small hard pretzels, which are a prominent member of the danger list. They're totally different things, I assure myself. You know, it's really been remarkable how much progress you've made in such a short time with Dr. Nelson. It's like your mom, I bark at her. Just don't. Just please don't. The walkways are crammed with people, their legs buffeting against ours, but I'm alone and trapped. I can't talk about this with her. Alice and Marie, enough of this attitude and enough of shutting me out. I'm worried about you, damn it. Pretzel gripped between her two fingers. She slams her hand down on her thigh. My eyes spread wide. She never curses at me. With a small noise, I move to speak. No, Allison, no. For just a second, I am your mother, and I love you, and I want to help you. That's my job. That's what I'm here for. So stop shutting me out. You can trust me, and I want to be here for you. She isn't crying, but I can hear the pain oozing out of her voice. Months worth of pent-up frustration and concern. Weeks worth of silent waiting rooms. I'm your mother. This is my job. Please let me help you. Let me be a part of this. I take a deep breath and shoot my eyes to the ceiling. It's not you, Mom. The sentence comes out with a long, meaningful exhale. It's just that, I don't know, this stuff is embarrassing. It's weird. Even I don't really understand it. I shrug at her and we make eye contact. I take a bite of pretzel to buy a few seconds, but I don't really have anything else to say. It's not you, I shake my head for emphasis. I promise. I'm on my way to chemistry and I'm strutting like I'm on a catwalk. Today I've got my safe khakis, a bra, the pink button-up shirt my mom picked out, which surprisingly isn't that bad, and the new white blazer. I look awesome. I feel awesome. I can do anything. Me. This girl. I can overcome pencils and calculators and spend gift cards. I can take notes in class and drink milk and wear socks. I've got my chin up and I'm trying my best not to tiptoe while still avoiding the sidewalk cracks. Humming to myself, I push my way into the heated sciences building. Eyes up, shoulders relaxed. I've blossomed out of Hunchback of Notre Dame and into a normal upright position. I'm a few steps into the classroom when I realize Miss Matthews is calling my name. I turn to her and it's obvious from the look on her face that she repeated herself multiple times before I heard. Allison, thanks for joining us. You've been missing a lot of class recently. I freeze like a frightened deer and I begin to tremble like one too. What's that? I had heard her, but I don't have a response. Stall, stall, stall. I said that you've been missing a lot of class recently. She pauses for five long seconds, during which every head in the class turns to look at me. I feel my right leg rising into the air. I take a gulp of breath and hold it in. And this is a very important chapter we're on. It's really the foundation for the rest of the semester. There's no question here, but apparently her bulging eyes insist. I'm supposed to respond. A warm nausea rises into my stomach. My appointment's with Dr. Nelson. We meet twice a week in the afternoons. Before the start of the semester, Dr. Nelson and my mom quietly coordinated with school administrators so I'd be granted excused absences for all my appointments. Under my adamant input, however, they did not contact any of my teachers directly. I don't want them to know what's going on. I'm a straight-A student in their eyes, or at least I hope they still see me that way, and I want to keep it like that. So, she throws her flabby arms into the air and her collection of bracelets and bangles clink loudly together. I look back up at her. Right, yeah, I've had appointments. So many in the first weeks of school. I nod, tight-lipped, and let out a small mm-hmm. Pivoting on my planted foot and coming down from the flamingo stance, I move to march in between the tiles to the lab table in the back. Do you even eat? Her voice hits the back of my tangled head. What? It comes out like a croak, and I whip around to face her. Your pants. They're falling off of you. It's all bones and... She crinkles her face. Skin. The room is silent. Twenty-five curious heads await my answer. Yes, I eat. I suddenly wish I had my pile to hide behind. My shoulders begin to slope forward under my new jacket, returning to their default position. I mean, I've lost some weight, I guess, but I definitely eat. It's just that I'm flailing, rambling. My mouth opens and closes like a fish slapped on a dry wooden dock. She sits with me at lunch, Miss Matthews. The voice comes from nearby. It's Jenny. She's got her hand raised, and she's pushing up off her desk with her arm so she can look the teacher in the eye. The girl eats like she's starving. Trust me, it's actually impressive. 
I look at Jenny, who's staring straight ahead, and then up at Miss Matthews. A few seconds of silence. What could have fooled me? She moves her arm in the air, pointing at my head, then lowering her finger down my body. And with that, she turns to the blackboard and picks up a a stick of chalk. Jenny sits in the fourth seat on the outside row. When I move by her, I focus all my energy as looking as normal as possible. Maybe she'll notice my new blazer. I can't resist a glance. Just one furtive look in between steps. I can't be sure. I'm trying so hard to be subtle, but I think she might be smiling at me. Not a usual Jenny smile, only the tiniest of movements around the corners of her lips. A small raise of her cheeks, but I'll take it. Thank you, Jenny.